Hey, my name is Chris Vail. I'm a professor of sociology and public policy at Duke University. And today I wanna to talk to you about how to publish a book in computational social science. So thank you uh, for joining me today to, to, to learn about how to publish a book in computational social science. Why should you listen to me about how to publish a book in computational social science? Um, I've written three books, and I've written three very different kind of books. I've written a very academic book that I hoped would be read by a small group of people, and I've written a very public book that I hoped would be read by a large group of people, and as we'll see, those are sort of very different tasks. I'm also the editor of a book series for Oxford University Press in computational social science, and we publish book-length uh, manuscripts that um, report on the results of original empirical analyses. In computational social science, we also publish um, technical books and, and textbooks. Um, and we also um, publish sort of ethical pieces on, um, on computational social science as well. I also frequently review books for university presses and, and other publishers. And so sort of been through the ringer for a while now. Um, and uh, I think I have a, a fair amount of information to share about the topic. I will, however, say, though, that um, you know, as with every other piece of career advice, you know, there's never a one-size-fits-all solution to you know, success. Um, and, and you're going to see that there's a lot of heterogeneity in different types of books and how one succeeds in different types of areas. So you might, you know, you might be asking, OK, I'm a junior scholar. I haven't, you know, maybe I'm just starting to publish articles, and you know, um, most of the people in computational social science don't seem to be writing books, and writing a book seems like really involved and something that really senior people do, and so why should I even think about writing a book? I don't think everyone should write a book. Um, I, I think that's, a, that's sort of an outdated academic ideal that used to exist in social science. It used to be, you know, you had to write your book, and your book was your contribution to knowledge and your opus or whatever you want to call it. And we're clearly like far past that stage. Science is moving so rapidly that a lot of the most interesting conversation is unfolding in uh, journals and sometimes conference proceedings and much more kind of rapid delivery mechanisms for, um, for uh, communicating knowledge. So you might be saying, like, why on earth would you want to write a book? And I'm going to give you two, two my, my two best answers are as follows. First, a book is just profoundly different than writing an article. When you write an article, if you have a chance to check out my video on how to publish an article in computational social science, you'll see that you are really trying to enter a pre-existing conversation among a group of researchers who have already been talking to each other for a very long time. And for that reason, you're sort of inherently constrained in what you can do, right? You have to use their terms, you have to use their, you have to test their theories, you have to use well-validated measures, and there's sort of like a, a tried and true way of doing that. A book is sort of fundamentally exciting because you have the opportunity to start an entirely new conversation. So instead of sort of navigating a, uh, you know, a well-trodden um, field and set of concepts, a book can introduce a new idea. It can reframe a conversation. It can say, hey, all of you who have been talking about this thing in this way, you're really missing the point. There's a whole other way, different way of thinking about this. You have a lot more latitude as a book author to define the terms of the conversation. A book is fundamentally a conversation you are trying to have with somebody else when you are not there. And that's a powerful thing when you think about it, right? That, that's a real kind of influence. Um, articles, who reads articles, right? Scientists, other computational social scientists, maybe some people you're a big fan of or, you know, are mostly writing articles, but, but guess what? Those are pretty much the only people who read scientific articles, right? The second main reason to think about writing a book, in my view, is to shape public conversation, to have influence. Um, you know, computational social science has a rare opportunity to influence the world. You know, I, I, you know if you've seen my other videos, you know I get on my soapbox about how so many of the problems of the world right now are fundamentally in, involve computational social science. They're fundamentally questions about how data and human behavior are, are becoming in, intrinsically and in, 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 inextricably linked, and, and we need solutions. 
Very few people, you know, get invited to, say, a government hearing to provide input on how to improve the information ecosystem because of a, you know, well-received article they published in, uh, you know, political analysis or sociological methods and research, or even the proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences. Very few companies invite people to speak, um, or nonprofits invite people to speak because they p published that new killer NLP technique that came out in EPG, EP, EPJ data science, right? They publish the person who wrote, or they, they want to hear from the person who wrote the book on it. In other words, writing a book as a kind of credential. It's a way to have influence in a public conversation. It, 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 it kind of bestows upon the author a kind of authority. It's not automatic. Right? You still have to write a good book. You have to write a book that, that, that makes a compelling argument that people want to read. Um, but it's a, it's a way of entering a conversation that you might never think is possible. Until I wrote my first book, I didn't really, I, I cared a lot about, you know, public impact. I wanted to have public impact, but I was also sort of like narrowly focused on, I want to get a job, I want to get tenure, I want to do this and that. And then I sort of started to realize like, hey, I have a lot to say. You know, and it's more like I can't say it in 8,000 words. And I don't really like using this term. And you know, when I, it, nobody outside of these 200, group, 200 sociologists even knows what that term means. You know, and I, and I would like my research to impact. Like I was, I was at the time writing about um, the rise of anti-Muslim um, hysteria in the United States, and was seeing mosques burning, and you know, all sorts of horrific discrimination and things like that. And I was like, I want to get, I want to get this stuff out there. I know things that I think, you know, can, can, can sort of. This sounds like a little bit of hyperbole, or like you know, grandiose, you know, some a little grandiose, but like. I think something I know can help people, you know? And they're not gonna read American Sociological Review much as I think is, <laughs> it's, it's a great journal and I, I learn a lot from it, right? So um, books not only give you a new space to, to, to have impact, right? They're, they're a thing in the world, they're a kind of currency to have influence, but they're also an opportunity to start a new conversation, to string together an existing conversation, to challenge an existing conversation, to change the terms of science. So whereas if we look at the long-term impact of articles, we see they sort of have a short half-life. We look at books, they have a long, much longer half-life. They tend to influence people longer. And here's something that's particularly important for computational social science, and one reason why I'm particularly evangelical about getting people interested about writing books in, com in computational social science is if you want to have impact across fields, books are a much more efficient delivery mechanism. Why? Well, we all know, we all get, you know, you know, certain engineers are only want to publish in ACM or ICWSM, and the sociologists want to publish over here. But if you write a book, right, and you use terms and language that's queer and accessible to large groups of people, right, it opens a new audience up, right, um, uh, to your work. So um, books are cool, and, and books are also evolving. Um, you know, you might think, man, like, in this day and age when, like, we have, like, YouTube influencers are, are, are influencing our public debate, or TikTok, or whatever, right? Like, it's like, who writes a book anymore, right? But books are also evolving. You know, we, we have audiobooks now, right? We have podcasts that, that talk about books, you know. Books, you know, sort of often lead to invitations to, to have discussions with people we might not talk about, talk to normally. And also, um, technology is fundamentally changing what books are and what they can be. So, you know, my good friend Matt Felganek pioneered this new open peer review process where you can now write a book and benefit from community impact uh, input and, um, you know, write a better book. Um, in my last book, I, um, I used it as an opportunity to introduce um, apps and bots that we had built in the polarization lab that I lead um, to try to, again, invite another way for people to interact with data. Um, you know, a book, again, is it's a project. It's a big thing that allows you to, it, it can be so many different things, and we're really only beginning to explore the space of creativity for what books can be and what they can mean. Not all books need to be long, either. That's another common reason why people think, um, you know, uh, they shouldn't write books, right? Like, I don't want to sit around and write 120,000 words. That sounds hard, right? There's no reason books need to be long. Short books can be great and, you know, and, and give you and bestow upon the author the same Level, level of influence. I'm not going to say it's not harder than writing an article. It is more involved than writing an article. Um, but again, there's all these other benefits. So 
not everybody should write a book, but I want to try to convince at least a few of the people um, watching this that um, you, know, you might be more um, of a book author than you realize. So should you write a book? Um, you know, it's going to depend on a lot of things. What are your goals? Do you want to have public impact? Then you, I would say writing a book is pretty important. If you're going to be in the think tank nonprofit circuit, it could be career making. Um, you know, in your academic field, it could vary a lot, right? Um, you know, computer scientists very rarely write, write books, but um, political scientists and sociologists write books all the time, right? Look at your field and the people you want to be like, and look at the types of books they write or whether they're writing books, and you can start to see, you know, like, is that a part of your career path? Um, you know, also recognize that um, things are changing and there's lots of different ways to have impact. But, you know, talk to mentors, talk to, talk to folks. There's a theme throughout all these professional, pro professionalization um, videos and why I'm giving this talk to try again, pull back the curtain of the book publication process to, um, to, uh, to, to try to encourage you to see behind the curtain. I think the best question to ask yourself if you're trying to figure out whether you should write a book is, does the idea of starting a new conversation and having broader impact excite you or scare you, right? If it excites you, you might be a book writer. If it scares you, writing a book's probably not for you. So there's lots of different types of books that computational social scientists write or, or, or can write. The first and probably most common is an academic book. And here, the goal is really to speak to other scholars. Um, you can kind of think of it as like an article on steroids you still have the opportunity to define a much longer conversation, to, to, to define a new conversation, to start the conversation on your terms, but you're still fundamentally, your audience is other academics. You're trying to convince them um, of your argument, you're using data often, um, you, maybe you have a lot more potential to influence people across disciplinary lines, but, but the fundamental target is other scholars. The second kind of book is often called a trade book, and this is a book where you're sort of trying to reach as broad an audience as possible. You know, no book is like read by everyone, unless like you get on like Oprah's list, I guess, or so, you know, so like, right, like it's not like, you know, the books that like your friends and family read are not the type of books that most people are gonna write. Those are the exception to the rule. You know, nobody's, very few people are gonna write a book that's like Harry Potter or something, right? Which if you haven't read it, I'm sorry, but there's something wrong with you, right? Um, a trade book usually still has an audience, right? It's going to be like uh, people, you know, like New York Times readers who are interested in technology and politics, or you know, um, people who like Atlantic articles on coronavirus, right? You know, it's sort of a circumscribed um, community. Um, but the goal, unlike with an academic book, you know, an academic book can do things like get you tenure or get you citations or get get you a job. Um, but um, it's probably not going to do much more than that. Whereas a trade book can, um, you know, the, the goal is, is, is much broader. It's to get lots and lots of people to read it. It's to, um, make, you know, the dream scenario is to reach a bestseller list, which, by the way, I once, can, I once, um, I once looked at the probability of, 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 of this happening, and it's like a fraction of a percent. Like a bestseller list is like the 15 bestselling books um, at any given time. Um, you're competing with Obama, Matthew McConaughey, and whoever else is famous at the moment who wrote a, you know, a memoir, a self-help book in the nonfiction space. It's practically impossible. So <laughs> probably none of us are going to write uh, bestsellers anytime soon. But the goal is, is, to, the goal is to reach a broad audience. Um, for some people, the goal is to make a lot of money, too. Um, you might be surprised how much money books make um, in the trade space. Academic books, you're not going to make a lot of money. You might make... A lot of people are only going to make a couple hundred dollars. If you're lucky, you might make a few thousand dollars. If you're you know, really lucky, you might make you know, $10,000, maybe $15,000. If the book goes gangbusters among other academics, maybe you'd make a little more than that. But if you write a trade book, um, and especially if you, have, uh, if you write a great trade book, um, the numbers can be pretty eye-popping. So six-figure contracts are not uncommon for very you know, high-value books or books that are seen to have um, a lot of impact, um, and I know um, academics whose advances, that means money you get paid before you write the book, were over a million dollars. Um, and these aren't the sort of, some of these people aren't the senior scholars you might think. Now these are very people who have amazing ideas and they're amazing writers and they've written, as we'll see, amazing proposals. But just to give you a sense of some of the, the stakes here, 
Um, some people are really, um, there's, a, there's an economic argument for writing sort of a trade book. Um, academic books are usually published by university presses, places like you know, Oxford University Press, Princeton University Press, uh, Columbia University Press, Harvard University Press, MIT Press, right? Trade books are like a huge family of corporations, you know, um, or sometimes they're called imprints, and these are basically parts of large publishing, publishing firms. Um, there's a whole ecosystem of literary agents and editors and publishers that you have to kind of learn to navigate if you go this route. Um, but um, they're, and they're much more concerned about publicizing the book towards a, a broader audience, and again, getting the book to, to have impact. Um, lastly, computational social scientists can sort of write a textbook, and this might be something like, you know, like, I don't think, um, you know, uh, Brandon Stewart and Justin Grimmer's book and Molly Roberts' book is really a, a textbook per se, but it's, it is fundamentally about, like, here's a method that I'd like you to learn how to use. Their book is, I think, not a textbook insofar as it makes some really interesting arguments about how we should do science on top of it, but they're, you know, sort of practical books, like how do you, you know, what do you, you know, how do you code a word embedding model and what do you do with it, right? Or, you know, how do you build um, apps or bots for social science research? These are kind of more textbooks. And again, some of these are very short. Some people write sort of like O'Reilly books even. But um, in this space, that's more common in computer science or information science than social science. But there's a market for textbooks out there. Here the audience is students, undergraduates, graduate students, master's students, other faculty members who, or, or people, researchers outside academia who want to learn a new skill. And um, often, and these can sort of be published by either academic presses or trade presses. Um, they are usually, um, they can be very lucrative, not as lucrative as the, you know, the, 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 the trade books I was talking about just now, but you know, the very best um, textbooks across their life, especially if they are reissued many times, could probably easily make six figures for the author or author. So there is some, some, some economic incentive involved. The sort of downside of writing a textbook is that um, it can sometimes be sort of viewed as, um, and I think this is unfair often, like a little less original or a little less impactful because it's simply corralling knowledge that's sort of already out there rather than defining something new and introducing a new idea. Um, and for that reason, a lot of people don't write textbooks when they're junior scholars because I think they worry that it might pigeonhole them as sort of a methodologist or something like that. And you typically see those more among more established scholars um, and, and also people who are really good at teaching. Um, that's another skill that, you know, because writing a good textbook means understanding your audience and your audience is students, and so it's a very different um, goal. And, you know, you, you're probably seeing a theme here that, like, you know, your audience is really important. Think of who your audience is. Something we almost never do when we're writing journal articles, right? Our audience is three anonymous reviewers, and that's pretty much it, right? Um, so all of a sudden, you're, like, people is your, <laughs> is your, is your, is your audience, right? It's a very different, different way of thinking about things. Okay, how does one write a book? Um, so, you know, like, we have this popular idea that, like, writing a book involves, like, I don't know, like, moving to a cabin in the woods and, like, sort of sitting down and you wake up and write, you know, like, just sort of linearly type out, like, 10,000 words and you go for a hike and then you, I don't know, kill a bear or something. I don't know. It's, my analogies are just getting weird now. Um, but, you know, that, that this is sort of this isolating process that you know you're 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 really doing it alone, and that you need space and time and distance from other people to write a book. This is a popular idea, right? Wrong. Again, like you know, all the other you know common theme in all of these professionalization videos. I hope you've seen by now, if you've watched some of the other ones, is that um, you know it takes a village. A book is a collective endeavor, just like everything else. You're going to be talking to other researchers as you write a book. You're going to be talking a lot to editors. If you write a trade book, you might talk to a literary agent. Um, you might spend uh, you know, days and weeks talking to a literary agent before you even begin to break ground on a book proposal, which is the first step most people take in writing a book, just to, just to kind of imagine the book and define the book and think about the audience and who might want to read it and why, right? Um, then once you publish a book, once again, you're getting input from all kinds of people. You're trying to see how different audiences react to it. A lot of people write books by giving lectures like this and trying to see how people react and learning how different people react to different kinds of messaging. That's a skill as an author that requires that you do a lot of this kind of interaction back and forth. Otherwise, what you're writing about in your cabin in the woods after you weirdly killed a bear for no reason 
is just sort of not relevant to people, right? You need to, you need to see how other people react to what you're saying. It's something that's sort of unique about a book. Again, it's a conversation with other people that you're having when you're not there. So you need to, you need to know these other people. You need to know what they care about and how they think and all those kinds of things. It's a much different sort of endeavor. Um, so it takes a village um, to, to write a book. That said, at the end of the day, you, the author or authors, have to write a book proposal. And most books begin as a book proposal. A book proposal does a few things. First, it presents the title of the book, obviously. And then um, most book proposals begin with a very concise description of the book, like, I mean, one or two paragraphs. And you can think of this as the text that would appear ultimately on the back cover of the book or the inside cover. What is this book about? In very general language that's accessible to a broad audience, even if it's an academic book, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, you know, why should someone pick this book and not the next book? You know, make your pitch in, in as little space as possible as to why someone should care about this book you spent, you're about to spend so much time writing. Next, there's a longer description of the book written for a general audience. So if you can think of that sort of concise statement as sort of an abstract, this is maybe like an extended abstract. It's maybe like one or two pages uh, single spaced. It just gets a little bit more into the general scope of the argument, you know, what theories are being advanced, what methods are being advanced if it's a textbook, you know, what, what sort of generally, who, who are, what are the general ideas that the student is going to learn about. Um, if it's a trade book, you know, like um, what events in the world is this responding to. Um, if it's an academic book, you know, what types of scholarly literatures are being engaged with, you know, things like that, a little more detail. Next, a book proposal will typically include uh, about a paragraph or two description of each chapter in the book. Um, and it talks about you know, like exactly what the reader will see, what you're going to talk about in each chapter of the book. And obviously, there's more detailed involved here. And then there's two steps that are sort of unusual to most first-time book authors or people who have never thought about writing a book. And the first is a market analysis. So this is, like how you, this is where you say, who's the audience for the book? Who's going to want to read this and why? In a trade book, this, it's enormously important to say, these are exactly the type of people who are going to buy this book. These are the type of people who are going to forego two or three lattes to buy my book. It's going to be so important to them that they need to read this book because X. It's going to be better than this other book that you may have heard of because Y. It's going to be new and original compared to this other book, but also similarly engage the same audience as this book because Z. Right? This is what a, this is what a market um, analysis does. For an academic book, there's still a market. Right? It's going to be people in intro to econ classes are going to want to read this. Um, graduate students in data science courses might want to learn about my textbook about natural language processing if it's a textbook. Right? Um, for the academic books, this is something a lot of people don't know. Like, you might think like books are just all about making money, money fundamentally. Most university presses lose money, lots of money. They are nonprofits. They're part of the university. Their mission is to let knowledge out into the world. It's not to make money. Now, would they like to make money? Sure. But they're not dependent on making money like a trade press or a, or a for-profit publisher would be. But you still need to tell them that there's a point to doing this book, that people are going to want to engage with it. Because at the end, though they might not be after making money, they're out for impact and prestige. So Oxford University Press wants to publish the authors that are the best and brightest in, in, in starting the new conversations and making the exciting arguments. They still care if it, you know, the, they wind up you know, publishing an op-ed in the Washington Post or, you know, um, or Der Spiegel or wherever you are, you know, where, wherever you are in the world. Um, they care about that impact, um, but it's, it's, it's not as much about making money. So that's the market analysis. And the final part of the book proposal is you. Who are you, the author, and why are you the person to write this book? Depends on the kind of book about what your qualifications need to be. Right? If, you, if you have a PhD in computer science and you're about to write a book on ethnography, people are probably going to ask some questions. Right? Why are you qualified to do this? What are your, what's your training? Can we trust you to do this? Right? But it doesn't mean that you have to have a PhD in, in linguistics to write a natural language processing book necessarily. If you've published in the area, you can say I've published in the area. If you built tools or R packages in the area, if in the case of a textbook, you could say things like that. Um, if it's a trade book, then it's about much more about who are you, the author. And the weird thing about an academic book is the author doesn't really matter. You know, if you ever read like the acknowledgments to an academic book, like 
thank you to my advisor and my friends from graduate school and the grant organization. Like nobody wants to read that bad word, right? People, um, people, um, people don't really care who you are as the author. And now there's exceptions. If you're an ethnographer, for example, writing about yourself is really important. You're going to be talking about you know your reflexivity and how you had the critical distance to understand how your who you were shaped you know who you were interacting with and those kinds of things and that kind of self awareness is probably good no matter whether you're an ethnographer if you're a survey uh, researcher you know you still want to have that level of self reflection about who you are and whether you approaching someone from you know I don't know um, as, as someone who works at Colorado State University. Um, shaped how the you know, gun owners you were trying to survey thought about you because they maybe are fundamentally skeptical of academics, right? You need that level of self-awareness. But in a trade book, you, the author, are actually important. You're sort of like a character often in the, in the play or in the story, right? It's not a story if you're doing research writing. It's going to present research. But, you know, why you came to be interested in these things is important. Why you have some you know, ground to, to be an expert, ground to be an expert in this area is important. Um, you know, how you became interested might help other people become interested in it, right? Um, you know, and there's sort of different ways of approaching this challenge, you know. The sad thing is, most of us academics aren't as interesting as we think we are, right? Um, in, in my last book, I was writing for a very public audience, and this was like the biggest challenge for me. I'm like, I'm really not that exciting. Like, you know, I, like, I just don't think someone should give up two lattes to hear about my life. It's just not that interesting, right? But what I, what I realized over time and learned from talking to other people who had written books and learned, again, learned from other people and learned by trying and failing a lot, a common theme in these professionalization videos, is that um, there are other tricks we as researchers can do. Like, for example, the research method can become the protagonist. That was sort of like a major revelation for me. Like, you know, it's actually sort of people, though I might not be interesting as a person, um, as a scientist, it's sort of interesting, like how does science work? A lot of people care about that. You know, a lot of people care about how we arrive at our conclusions, the missteps we make, you know, the errors we have to overcome, the challenges. There's a kind of story there that's actually pretty exciting. And you can make, this, you can make science the protagonist in a really interesting way, and it creates a, a sort of compelling narrative. And so things like narrative and the arc of the story are things that matter much more in a trade book where, again, the goal is to keep people turning pages, whereas in an academic book, people are sort of looking for very technical information in a detailed field, so it's a fundamentally different endeavor. Okay, to wrap up, um, sort of what do editors look for? You know, again, does the book um, sort of define its, 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 its uh, proposed goal? You know, is it gonna, are people going to give up two lattes to buy this book? Um, are the people in that introduction to political science class really going to want to read this? Is, is someone going to sign this book in that class? Are there already too many textbooks about word embeddings for that to matter, right? Um, you know, these are all the types of things that editors might do. And, you know, lastly, like let's say the editor likes the book, so like sort of what happens? Well, um, a few things can happen. Um, first of all, Editors are inundated with books, book proposals all the time by people from all over the world in academic publishing and trade publishing, et cetera. And um, you know, rejection is the norm. They can't possibly publish all of the um, all of the books. And so what they'll often do is reject book proposals. You know, sometimes you might you might not even get a decision, right? You don't get the the the, the feedback you so badly crave. Um, but if you um, if you're lucky, you might get. Um, sort of two outcomes. The best possible outcome would be to get an advanced contract on your book. And that's where, based on your book proposal alone, the publisher and editor is so excited that this is going to turn into an impactful book that they're willing to commit to publishing your book. You're still going to have to get it reviewed, and, and you're going to have to write a good book in the book you said you would write. But they are agreeing to write it in principle. You can sort of think of this as like an R&R &R outcome in the journal publishing process. It's sort of the best outcome in that, like, there's, it's more likely than not, and, and probably much more likely in the case of book publishing, because there's so much that needs to go into writing a book and publishing a book and producing a book into the world, that they're not going to make that decision lightly. Another good outcome is the person says, this sounds interesting. Send me the full manuscript, right? And then there's another round, round of review, and that's when you would get a contract, and that's how the book would sort of come into the world. 
And you know, editors are going to use a lot of different criteria. They're going to talk to other people. A lot of editors of academic books will be going to scholarly conferences to try to see what the interesting hot questions are. They're going to be talking to potential authors. They're going to be talking to authors that they work with to find other authors. And likewise, trade presses. These people all talk and go to lunch together and sort of learn and network from each other. And you know, hang out in these places we used to go called bookstores, um, where you know people talk about what they're reading and, and sort of what excites them. So the main takeaways, um, just to wrap up, um, is that you know once again it's a collective endeavor. Um, talk to lots of people who have been through it before. Um, you know, think of books as an opportunity to start a new conversation, a kind of credential, a gateway into more influence. If you're, if you're lucky, not all books are going to be influential, but. Um, you're, I think, much more likely to have impact across disciplinary lines and among the general public if you consider writing a book. And just like with the, um, you know, the other, the other uh, videos I've done on um, publishing an article or getting grants, learn to detach yourself psychologically from the book a little bit. You know, the book is a thing. Um, you are the author, but the book can be good or bad, and that doesn't mean you're a bad or good person. It might seem a little more personal. It might feel a little more personal as a book writer, because, especially if you write about yourself in the book. Um, but, you know, um, you know, take, take constructive uh, criticism and, 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 and try to make the current manuscript or the next book better. Think again about your audience. Think early and often. Who are you writing this book for and why? Um, how are they going to react? To do that, again, do a lot of tests. You know, maybe if you're starting out teaching for the first time, try a lecture on a book chapter. See how people react. It's, if it's Thanksgiving dinner and your aunt is there or your uncle who knows nothing about what you do, Try to pitch them a, a book and see if, does that sound like something you'd want to read? See how different types of people react. And um, those are my main sets of advice for writing a book. And um, I hope you've learned something from this lecture. And um, if, you've, if you've not yet done so already, check out some of the other series in our uh, other videos in our professionalization series here at the Summer Institutes in Computational Social Science. Thank you very much. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed this video on how to publish a book in computational social science. Now, publishing a book isn't for everyone, but I hope I've inspired you to think seriously about some of the real positives of getting a book out there. The first is your opportunity to define the conversation above and beyond what reviewers care about and above, above and beyond what we see in sort of the narrow debates that tend to consume us in academia. This is your passport to influence, not only broader influence within your field, but across fields and maybe even outside academia as well.